Well, welcome back to this exciting session. The uh, last part of this evening's presentation will be Dr. Lisa jones Angle. Uh, she's Senior Research Scientist at the Washington National Primate uh, Research Center here at the University of Washington. She's an Affiliate Associate Professor in Anthropology, and she likes to think of herself as a macaque. <laughs> she's a little bit jet-lagged because she's been in Bangladesh, and I said, are you going to feel sleepy? And she said, oh no, if I can be talking about monkeys, it's just going to be great. She's a consummate generalist. Her primate research uh, center has straddled the field, uh, the natural habitat, habitat for non-human primates, and the research laboratory. She began doing field research uh, with primates at the age of 17 in Kalimantan, Indonesia. So lifelong passions. For 30 years uh, plus, she's worked with human primate interface in Asia, characterizing the ways that humans and macaques interact and developing strategies to detect the infectious agents uh, that are transmitted at this porous boundary. Her research illustrates the concept that humans and non-human primates often constitute a single reservoir in which pathogens or infections can evolve and emerge. For the past 12 years, at the Washington National Primate Research Center, she's built a multidisciplinary international research program called Evolution and Emergence of Infectious Diseases that integrates microbiology, epidemiology, bioinformatics, geographic information systems, and primatology, as well as human and veterinary medicine. Dr. Jones Engel completed her PhD at the University of New Mexico in 2002. She just returned, as I said, uh, from Bangladesh, and uh, she's completed her Fulbright uh, Scholar Program, and uh, I'm thrilled to have her giving us information sort of hot off the press, straight out of the field tonight. So we're thrilled she's with us. You know, primates are compelling. More than any other species, we as humans are, we're drawn to primates. When we look in their eyes, we really see a reflection of ourselves. And this, this desire to be near them, to make a connection with them, has led to this very broad and diverse human-primate interface. <laughs> Wild primates were considered the only real primates. And that fault actually lies with generations of primatologists who felt that any primate that was at the interface that had contact with humans was somehow corrupted. They were somehow corroded. And so for decades, the majority of the work was focused on behavioral and socio-ecological research. But then, something happened. A few things happened that actually began to change the way that, that people thought about primates. And those things were the disease transmission actually occurred at that human-primate interface. At first, it was simply a slow trickle of data coming out of Africa that implicated these African primates who were infected with recombinant viruses, which then re uh, re resulted in the transmission of SIV to humans. Then the outbreaks of Ebola and anthrax were associated with bushmeat hunting. And most recently, in the early 2000s, the fifth human malaria actually emerged. And this malaria emerged precisely at that human primate interface where humans and monkeys were sharing an environment. People began to pay attention. They really began to be afraid of what was being transmitted at that boundary, what was occurring in the ecological context where humans and primates come into contact. What's going on there? It was no longer just about the wild, untouched monkey. It was about that animal that was there with us. So where precisely are those interfaces? Where do humans and primates come together? The human-primate interface actually spans the globe, but it's, it's really not an even distribution. And we see this in terms of the, the numbers of humans. So if we look at this, this photograph, 
the dark squares are actually evidence. The darker the square, the more humans there. And the green actually represents kind of a broad primate distribution across the globe. Clearly, there, there are areas of overlap, so you can see that. However, those, we, those overlaps are not consistent. And in places such as in, in Africa, where over the last couple of decades, more than 60% of the habitat that's suitable for the great ape population and for many of the primate populations has been, been devastated and wiped out. So we have merely thousands of apes now are actually distributed across West, Central, and East Africa in small pockets of, of areas with, with humans. The situation is very, very different, though, when we look in Asia. There, where you can see how intense the interface is, how deep the overlap is. In places like northern India, in the past two decades, more than 80% of the rhesus macaque population has become urbanized, living directly with humans. If we look down in the, the monkey temples of Bali or up in Hong Kong and the Kowloon Hills, those populations of primates have increased 200 or 300 percent in the same period in the last two decades. Clearly, the way that humans and primates come into contact is very different. It takes a very special primate, a very special animal, to be able to kind of live cheek and jowl with humans. And there's a term for that primate. It's called a synanthropic primate. And synanthropy is actually it's an ecological term. It's a term that means together, syn, anthro, with man. And typically, the term has been applied to species like crows and rats and, and biting flies, all species that are particularly gifted at thriving at the human primate interface and adapting to the niches that humans make when they change the environment. Sorry, that's not working for you. It's actually was a great little video of those guys doing their thing. But I assure you, not every primate is capable of demonstrating synapathy. It takes a very, very special kind of monkey. It actually, it takes the macaques. These are, these are the, the super monkeys. These are the Darwinian superstars of the primate world. In fact, macaques are going to inherit the earth, along with the, the crows and the biting flies and the other synanthropic species. Only humans are more geographically dispersed than macaques. So up in the north, in the, the snowy mountains of Japan, clear across to the Atlas Mountains in, in northern Africa, in the tropical forests of Indonesia, up through um, mainland Southeast Asia, over into Afghanistan, 17 different species of macaques can be found. Immunologically, behaviorally, culturally, their relationships with humans are very, very special, and they are like us in so many ways. One of the very important things about macaques is that there are enough of them. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of macaques, so that their numbers are large enough so that we can actually take the tools of epizootology, epidemiology, and apply them to our studies of these animals when they're in the field, so that we can truly understand how disease transmission is occurring at this interface. They, um, they're also extremely well studied. Humans owe an enormous debt to the macaque because they have been our biomedical model of choice for decades. Much of what we know about uh, infectious disease, chronic disease, human behavior is based on laboratory studies that come from these macaques. And the macaque species diversity and spread, that geographic spread, is actually matched by the diverse context in which they come into contact, in which they interact with humans, particularly in Asia. Hanuman, the Hindu deity, is one of the main figures in the Ramayana. Hanuman is worshipped for his bravery, his quick wit, his devotion. The macaques and langurs that we see in Asia today are actually considered the, the children of, of Hanuman throughout Asia. They, uh, and because of this, they are remarkably well tolerated, except in extreme conditions. We have pet primates throughout all of Asia. We have markets and, and bushmeat hunting occur in these contexts. Urban monkeys, I just mentioned the, uh, the rhesus macaques in, in northern India, but the urbanized rhesus macaque is spread throughout all of South and Southeast Asia. Certainly wild primates. 
We have lots of wild macaques still in Asia. And the performing monkeys, which I'll actually get to a little bit more at the, later, at the end of these. The, um, but it's important to remember that none of these contexts are, these aren't exclusive categories. Urban and wild monkeys may end up in the pet trade. Performing monkeys escape or are released. These temples and shrines are actually veritable mixing pots for animals that are drawn to these kind of cultural and religious islands of safety. So these interfaces and the animals within them are constantly mixing in Asia. And that's very important to understand when we think about infectious disease transmission. So it's within these, these shifting contexts that, that my team has worked. So for more than a decade, we focused on the bi-directional transmission of infectious disease agents, both how it's moving from human to, to animal and from animal to human. The team works in several countries, Bangladesh, obviously where I've just come back, Singapore, Thailand, Nepal, Indonesia, Gibraltar. We're expanding into South America soon. Um, we certainly, this kind of work can only be done with a lot of ologists. It takes primatologists, it takes biological anthropologists such as myself, so the veterinarians, the physicians, the epidemiologists, the microbiologists, the GIS folks, the photographers. The reason that you're getting such good images on this one is because National Geographic often sends a photographer out with us and being able to have good images to show and convey your science to both other scientists and to lay populations is critical if you want to really get people to understand your stories. One of the things that our work really emphasizes is that it, the critical importance of doing longitudinal, longitudinal assessments and monitoring of our study sites because we recognize that the environment and the relationship between these populations of humans and animals are constantly changing. There is nothing static about the human and primate interface. There is nothing static about the environment. Even though humans and primates in Asia have been together for 25,000 years, I assure you that relationship continues to change and evolve. So obviously we focus on these synanthropic primates, these synanthropic macaques, because I'm interested in, in animals that share the environment with humans. And over the last 12 or 15 years, we've trapped and sampled and released about 2,000 macaques. Um, we've done about 12 or 1,500 humans. I can also assure you that it is so much easier to get blood out of a, a monkey than it is to get blood out of a, a human. Um, the humans say, ouch, the humans run away. I can always entice the, the macaque in with, with the proper food. We collect a suite of biological samples. So urine, hair, feces. No feces goes to waste. The, uh, it was on my daughter's shirt. We took it right from, directly from it. The, um, and we're always collecting paired biological samples, and that's very important to remember. So if we're looking at urban monkeys. We sample the humans who are in direct contact with those animals as well as the monkeys that are in that environment. And again, to mention, we, we really focus on longitudinal assessments because we recognize that, and it's certainly within this one health paradigm, that in order to develop good sampling strategies, you have to be looking in a place continually over time because things change, and that's critically important. Our laboratory assays, are, our um, collaborators are amongst the, the best in the world. They also were working with the Hutch, the CDC, the primate centers, St. Jude's. They also recognize the importance of how incredibly valuable and difficult it is to obtain these, these samples. As I mentioned, we catch these monkeys, we anesthetize them, we sample them, we let them go back again. You can't go back. If you lose that sample, you can't go back and get it again. So our labs have gotten very good over the years about knowing how precious every drop of monkey blood it is that comes into their laboratory. So the concept of One Health recognizes that human and animal health are inextricably linked. So certainly we look at public health and we look at primate conservation and we want to understand how these two are actually impacted side by side. In order to do that, so since 2006, we've been monitoring numerous infectious agents in, in South and Southeast Asia the coronaviruses, the mycobacteria, the tuberculosis. We're looking at influenza. Um, we look at the evolution and emergence of a particular simian retrovirus called simian foamy virus. 
Um, and certainly we do a lot of ecotoxicology work as well. Tonight, though, I want to just focus on just a couple of these infectious agents, and then also to spend the last few minutes kind of talking about the, the Fulbright that I just completed, where we were looking at a context that I find particularly compelling, and that is of the dancing monkeys of South and Southeast Asia, enteroviruses. The best known enterovirus is the polio virus. And so you can see the picture there, the iron lung. This is the, the pathogen that, that terrified, that literally paralyzed the, the world for decades. But there are a lot of enteroviruses out there. They have a worldwide distribution, these enteroviruses. There's a fecal oral route of transmission. Transmission is presumed to be person to person, but hold on to that thought. It can also be transmitted through contaminated water or food, so that means these viruses are present in the environment. Particularly in children, there's a very high rate of, or higher rate of infection. The more crowded or unsanitary the environment that you're in, the more likely that these enteroviruses are to be present. But about 60% of infections with enteroviruses among humans are considered asymptomatic. But there are some really, really nasty enteroviruses out there that are associated with things like acute respiratory syndromes, meningitis, muscle weakness, paralysis. And this virus, it's important to remember, actually hangs around for a long time. People can be shedding the virus, or animals, can be shedding the virus for a long time. That's what we know about enteroviruses in a nutshell in humans. We happen to know a little bit about enteroviruses in primates because the, the rhesus macaque, this super monkey, was the monkey that was actually used to help us understand and develop vaccines for polio virus. So back in the, the 1940s and 50s, nearly a million macaques, a million rhesus macaques, were actually imported from South Asia into the research facilities here in the US and, and Europe. And at that time, they were being used for polio research. But at that time, some of these animals, as they were developing diarrheal diseases in the, the laboratories, the scientists were looking at them, and they discovered some of these other enteroviruses. Now, because they were coming from a monkey, they were called a simian enterovirus. So we had a little bit of information. We know humans can have enteroviruses, and we know monkeys can have enteroviruses. And we know there are a lot of different serotypes as well. So fast forward to the late 1990s where research by the, the WHO and the CDC suggested that four enteroviruses in particular, EV76, EV89, EV90, and EV91, these viruses were actually identified in sick human children in Bangladesh. And when the, the CDC was serotyping these and doing the genetics work on them, they actually found that these viruses were most closely related to a virus called SV. 46 up by that red arrow. Now, SV46 was a simian virus 46 that was first identified back in the 1940s, 1950s from these Asian rhesus macaques that were brought over to the laboratories here in the US. So, the WHO and the CDC were like, hmm, how did this happen? Are these children in Bangladesh, are they getting infected with a monkey virus? Are these EV76, 89, 90, 91, are these, are these monkey viruses? Are these a recombinant virus between, between humans and primates? What is actually going on out there in this, this pathogen landscape at this interface between humans and primates in Bangladesh? So they called me because that's what I do. I do monkeys in Asia. And remember what I was talking earlier about there are different degrees of the human-primate interface, depending on where you're looking at in the globe. And I would like to, to point out that the hottest of the hot spot is precisely where we're working, which is in Bangladesh. 136 million people, plus or minus, one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Poverty and disease are obviously kind of endemic in this, this population. The seasonally, it's the, the country is seasonally flooded, so it's inundated with flood waters. Sanitation is, is certainly an issue. But despite these, these problems, the country is extraordinary in that it's maintained about 13% of its land is still forested. They have an amazing 
primate diversity. Ten different species of primates are actually found in this very small country. The rhesus macaque, again, the one who is so good at being able to kind of live and thrive at that human primate interface, is the predominant monkey. They're found largely in the urban areas because if a rhesus macaque has a choice between living in the forest and living next to a humans where humans have changed the environment, those monkeys are gonna go right for the humans because the living is really good there. <laughs> so these, these conditions, these behavioral, these immunological, these ecological, these actually, all these conditions favor the circulation and the transmission of these enteroviruses at this human primate interface. What did we find when we went to Bangladesh and started trying to characterize the enterovirus pathogen landscape? Well, first we did it over multiple seasons. We looked during the wet season, we looked during dry seasons, we looked over multiple years. We collected more than 800 monkey fecal samples. That's a lot of monkey poo. I just, you had, some, you had some ape poo on you. I've had a lot of monkey poo. I actually, I'm, I'm kind of used to it by now. The, um, the samples were screened and serotyped by the CDC. About 11.5% of the fecal samples were, were positive for an enterovirus. Of these monkey fecal samples were positive for an enterovirus. 27 human, um, or 27 serotypes were actually identified there. The extraordinary thing, and maybe it's not so extraordinary, as, as I look back on it now, it's not so extraordinary, but the extraordinary thing to me at that time was that, and we were looking in, we were looking at urban monkeys, we were also looking at monkeys that were out in, in the forest, or monkeys in the tea gardens, monkeys that had less contact with humans. But every monkey that we looked at that was anywhere near the human primate interface, they only had a human enterovirus. We only detected human enteroviruses. In fact, I had to go to the Dhaka Zoo to find a single simian primate enterovirus anywhere in this country. So the, the blue, the shades of blue recommend, or, uh, reflect a monkey virus. All the other shades uh, reflect human viruses. If you're a monkey and you're hanging out with humans, you're gonna have what we call, because we first saw it in humans, a human enterovirus. Now, the problem with this is that we don't yet know what direction, how, the direction of transmission. So we go back to, we found that EV76 and that EV90, these were the two really highly pathogenic enteroviruses that were occurring in the sick human kids. We found these viruses in these urbanized monkeys as well. And actually there's a, a group in Africa that found EV76 also in humans and monkeys that have close contact. So we, we know that these viruses, these highly pathogenic viruses, can exist in these monkey populations. So this, this becomes a little bit problematic when we think about one of the, the, the definition for an eradicable disease is that there can be no other vertebrate host for this, this pathogen. If you want to eradicate smallpox or you want to eradicate polio, the thought is that no other vertebrate host out there other than humans exists that can maintain this virus. That's clearly not the case with enteroviruses. So this is making us rethink particularly about these viruses and what constitutes a reservoir at the human, at the human primate interface. So now let's go to the other end of the monkey. Let's go to the mouths of the monkeys. And I want to talk a little bit how, basically how a logistical problem that we had in the field has actually led to the development of a new tool for the diagnosis of tuberculosis in humans. You know, TB infection is, is a global phenomenon. Well, but the mycobacteria are really ancient. These are really old obligate pathogens. An obligate pathogen means that it has to, it can't, it needs a host. It can't just live in the environment. It has to have a host in order to be sustained. You know, a, a third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. The presumed route of transmission is person to person through this kind of an aerosolized route. And importantly, the largest number of new cases of tuberculosis are actually occurring in Asia. Now, 
remember I said earlier, all of our biomedical models actually come from Asia, and that human primate interface is really intense in Asia. So that brought us to, to kind of this story. Tuberculosis is actually, it's the scourge for veterinarians in primate communities, in zoos. The, the thought has, has been that primates, macaques, are exquisitely sensitive to tuberculosis. Wave a few bacilli at them, and they just drop over dead. And this, this um, thought actually came about because, again, early in remember the 1940s, 1950s, we're bringing in a lot of these, these primates who were used as biomedical models for polio and other infectious disease. Well, some of these animals would come over, and there would be outbreaks, these kind of um, epidemics of tuberculosis in the animals as they were going through quarantine. And this was uh, considered an infectious threat for the, the human caregivers, the, the laboratory workers who were caring for these animals. So then that's what actually led to the development of the specific pathogen-free colony, the SPF colony. They wanted to protect human health. That's what drives the SPF. And so ex very extensive screening procedures were put in place to, to look for tuberculosis in these animals. But the problem with trying to detect TB in the laboratory, or actually in any primate, is that one, it relies upon an intact immune system. All of our assays expect that the immune system is going to be intact, which is problematic when you're using that animal and you're infecting it for other diseases because you're automatically suppressing the immune system. Two, the tests are very difficult to administer. So the, the TST, the tuberculin skin test, is actually involves placing a little blurb of OMT, mammalian tuberculin, in the eyelid of a macaque. And then reading that, reading the reaction at 24, 48, and 72 hours in this animal that's in a captive cage. And the other problem with many of the, the tuberculosis assays is that they're notoriously insensitive and nonspecific. And trying to place a TST in a free-ranging macaque and then being able to go back and find that macaque at 24, 48, and 72 hours, that simply was not going to happen in the field. But why, why, was I, why did I get this bug about tuberculosis and, and, and free-ranging macaques? It's because it didn't make sense to me. In the primate centers, we were terrified of TB coming into the colonies. But yet, I knew in Asia, in these areas, humans who were certainly exposed or infected with TB were, again, right there with these macaques. And I, I wasn't seeing a bunch of macaques drop over dead willy-nilly. I wanted to know, you know, what is happening with TB at this human primate interface? Are these animals getting infected with TB? Um, are they resistant to, be, to TB? Is there a different kind of TB? Am I completely missing it? but I knew that I needed to develop a different test to be able to detect it, something that was going to work for me in the field. And actually, being a biological anthropologist, it made it a little easier because I could think about it differently than, than the microbiologists or the TB folks. I knew basically, and along with working with the, the other person on this, that you know, TB enters and exits through the oral cavity. That was accepted. We knew that mycobacterial cells can adhere to cell surfaces. So I thought, hmm, TB comes in and out of the mouth, the cells adhere, why don't I then go and simply swab the inside of a macaque's mouth and see if I could actually recover some of the, the tuberculosis DNA. And it, it's a pretty straightforward process. You anesthetize your monkey, this one wasn't quite asleep, you swab with this omni swab a few times, run it across the cheeks, you take it, drop it into a little lysis buffer, close the cap, store it at room temperature, which is very important when you're working in the field. You fill out all your permits, get your CITES, your CDC permit, you bring them back into this country, you go into the laboratory, you do a fairly straightforward phenylchloroform extraction in your labs. You then do um, a real-time PCR, or you're looking for this kind of this IS-6110, which is a very specific, it's a diagnostic insertion um, section for tuberculosis, and there's nothing new about IS-6110. There's actually nothing new about using PCR for the detection of, of TB. The new thing was actually assuming that you could actually get it off of just by using these, these buccal samples. And then we also, we go through, we do some high-resolution melt curve analysis, and we do some sequencing just to confirm that what we were seeing in the laboratory, this really is 
mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. So that's what we did. And we did it with a lot of monkeys in a lot of different places. We did it obviously in, in Asia. We're doing it in the New World. These papers are just coming out right now. And what we saw is that there was certainly a clear epidemiological, a consistent pattern that was present. So if we looked in, in the northern portion of Sulawesi in Indonesia, the highest prevalence of tuberculosis in Indonesia is actually in that, that little peninsula there. And that also happens to be a hotbed for primate pet ownership. They also eat a lot of monkeys there too. But in places like that, that's where we were seeing the highest number of monkeys that were TB positive on this oral swab PCR, this OSP. In places like Gibraltar on the southern tip of Spain, where tuberculosis is virtually not found in the human population, we weren't seeing any TB in the monkeys. A consistent pattern was being developed there. And that, that then made us think, hmm, why don't we see what happens when we start looking in our laboratory primates? So we know this is a great technique to use in the field. Now actually, let's apply it to our, our lab monkeys. Because remember I said, our existing um, TB assays rely on this intact immune system. And as a biomedical primate, you generally don't have an intact immune system. And why is this so important to be able to accurately detect TB in the biomedical model? Because the model is only as good as it is as you know what's in it. So if there's any other unknown in that animal, be it the presence of TB or something else, that could be interfered with the processes that you're attempting to, to model, that's a real problem for, for human health. So we've obviously been, we've applied it in the, the field, we applied it in the primate laboratory, then we took the next logical step, which is to take this primate OSP, this oral swab PCR, and apply it to humans. And this work was done in collaboration with Jerry Cangelosi, who is a professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health here. And what we did with Jerry and some colleagues at the TB um, Clinical Trials Center in South Africa was to do a case-controlled study of individuals who were being treated for um, pulmonary TB. Why this is so important for humans and why everyone is very excited, and actually this paper just came out last week, is because the sputum sample is a notoriously difficult sample for detection of, of TB in humans. It's kind of the gold, the gold standard, but it's, it's, it's gloppy. It's hard to get people to actually expectorate that. You can never get children to get a good sputum sample. You have to worry about the, the human health workers when they're exposed to trying to get someone to generate a, a sputum sample. So being able to show in animals, in the primate, that we could, we could use this OSP to detect TB in these oral swamps, now being able to show this in human populations is huge. We showed also that the sensitivity of this assay is 90% sensitive and 100% specific. And I assure you, that, that's a very good test to have. And this also will actually allow, lead us to identifying this uh, mycobacterian pathogen landscape by identifying those people who may actually have been exposed but who don't go on to disease. Because the other thing we can do with these swabs and the DNA is actually to then strain type the different mycobacteria that are circulating in the population. And this is big. And again, it goes directly from animals in the wild to animals in the lab to now applying this to the human populations. So for the last couple of minutes, I want to focus on an extraordinary context of the human primate interface, and one that's actually very near and dear to my heart. It's also very fresh, because as I mentioned, I just got back from Bangladesh, where as, as a Fulbright scholar, I was actually able to, to focus on these folks for five months. So back in 2006, when I went to Bangladesh, I didn't actually, I didn't go looking for performing monkeys. I was perfectly content with my urban monkeys, my temple monkeys, and in fact, no one had ever really thought about the performing monkeys prior to this, except for these folks. And this was a paper in Lancet back in, in the 1970s. And it's actually, interestingly enough, they call it an ecological curiosity. And what this was, these um, two physicians were out there and they found, by following these performing monkey folks, who I'll explain in a minute, they found that by moving from place to place throughout Pakistan, the owners and the monkeys actually moved smallpox from village to village. That's 
You've got to pay attention to something like that. You should pay attention to something like that. You know, but performing monkeys and their, their, their human families have for centuries migrated around the globe. And it, it shouldn't come as any surprise because, as I said early on, primates really are compelling. You know, we see them, we see them heralded in the, the priceless, you know, the, the mice and art figures. We see them in the singeries, the, the whimsical paintings in the, the drawing rooms of, of Europe. You know, we, we dress them up, we, we have them perform, we make them dance. They're just like us, but primates are different enough that we can safely laugh at them. But to truly understand primates, you have to go to Asia. So even though you have the organ grinding monkeys in the New World, and you have the baboon performing monkeys in, in Africa, and you have the monkeys performing monkeys that were brought to, to Europe, nowhere is this interface broader or deeper than it is in Asia. So whether it is in Japan with the subtle washimi, there's actually monkey schools that continue today that where people train dancing monkeys. In China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Viet Laos, Thailand, across the entire region, performing monkeys are there. People particularly people in the West, have a very visceral reaction, I have found, to performing monkeys. Um, and I think part of that has to do that a lot of the images that we get about them have them completely disconnected from their context, have them disconnected from their, their families, from their role in the environment. And I just want to take a couple of minutes and give you a better sense of what it is, what it means to be a performing monkey. So whether we call them the, the Kalandar, the Bede, the Bandarwala, the Ahukuntaka, evidence of these nomadic peoples have existed since 1000 BCE. These are the, the, the Roma, the, the gypsies that we found that, that migrated out. They, they're, they're all linguistically linked. In South Asia, it's a fairly homogeneous ethnic group. You know, marriages tend to take place within close groups. Small family groups of 10 or 15 people travel together with their, their animals, and their ethnic identity is truly based on their skill in handling animals. So whether or not it's the training of, of snakes, the snake charmers, the monkey performers, the bear trainers, of which there are very few left, but the people are defined on how they interact directly with these, these animals. And while they're historically nomadic, that is changing to a certain degree. They are becoming increasingly settled, or at least to have kind of a home village that they can come back to. But they remain extremely marginalized. No one likes the nomad. No one likes the wanderer. And this has significant implications for them from both the pressures from society and, and economic pressures. So I want to talk specifically about the, the Bede of Bangladesh. These groups are actually, they're genetically linked with the, the groups right across the border. The borders mean nothing to, to wanderers, to nomads. They're just geolitical pores for them to find a way across. But there are at least a half a million Bede in Bangladesh. There are probably several million of them in, in India. There are 10,000 performing monkeys among the Bede themselves, just in, in Bangladesh. The lifelong flexibility is really stretched. These, these folks are the generalists. They do whatever they need to, to do to survive. And so from birth, you are together with these animals. These animals are part of the family. I asked a woman once, it's a very naive question, do you like your monkey? And she said to me, and this was translated, I had my translator repeat this for me. She said, we eat from these animals. And I thought, they eat their monkeys? I don't think they eat their monkeys. And so I asked again, and I actually understood. She said, no, we eat from these animals. Everything that they get, everything that they have, actually comes from these monkeys, from the relationship that they have with these animals. The women train while they're in the camps. Typically, when they go out to perform in the villages, though, the men are the one who do that, because the, the monkeys tend to be, they think, a little bit more 
aggressive and harder to handle when they're out actually performing in the villages. But they, they do whatever they need to do. They, they make and sell traditional medicines. They sell some amulets. They're involved in some shady stuff. But these people are, they're living on the edge, but they're making it work. Barely, because the socioeconomic realities of this tradition are extremely tough. Virtually no access to health care because you're nomadic. No access to basic social services, voting rights, education, again, because you're nomadic. Um, as I mentioned, nobody wants the wanderer coming through. No one wants them to kind of park in the field next to them. There's this, they're like, oh, they're dirty. Oh, they're going to steal. Oh, they're bad. Um, infant mortality is very high. Less than 50% of the kids are actually vaccinated. The human kids are, are vaccinated. And again, that's because they're constantly on the move. GI disease, tuberculosis, malaria are, are virtually endemic in, in these nomadic populations. In a country where most people make very little, the Bede, the performers, make very, very, very little. They have only three permanent or semi-permanent settlements throughout the entire of, of Bangladesh. So they are constantly, month after month, small family groups kind of moving this circuit throughout the entire South Asian region. They get their monkeys from a variety of different sources. Remember I mentioned there was that, uh, they still have that forested area, so they, they will catch them from um, the hill tracks area. Interestingly enough, they, about 60% of the animals that are in that trade at any one time are actively being, being moved about and traded amongst different family groups. That's important to remember. They use at least three different species of macaques as in these performances. Life is not easy when you're a performing monkey. Um, positive reinforcement is not part of the, the training approach that they take. The mortality is fairly high. Animals can also, they escape, or if they get very old or very sick, They'll simply be released wherever the, the traveling family group is at that time. It became clear to us when we were working on this project, the simian foamy virus, this zoonotically transmitted primate virus, that the Bede are playing a very special role in the kind of the, the pathogen landscape of this virus throughout Bangladesh. So we found lots of um, villagers, urban villagers, who, have, who are at this interface, who are infected with the simian foamy virus. But when we started looking at the genetics, we were finding that some of these folks were infected with viruses that none of the monkeys in their area would normally have had. And to make a long story short, it's been very clear that over the centuries, and certainly even currently, the Bede, as they've been moving animals throughout South and South Asia, are actually putting animals into populations that these monkeys could never have made it to them themselves. And that's, that's a very important, when you are interested in, like we are, in recombination and the emergence of pathogens, when you have animals mixing that wouldn't normally on their own be able to mix, that makes for a, that, that's where things can get really interesting. But the other thing that gets really, really interesting about these, these Bede is, remember I said that, you know, they're from birth, they are next to these animals. You know, people will own eight, 10 animals in their lifetime. Everyone is bitten, scratched, peed on, pooped on, scars. You know, people, the, the bed are not washing the, any of these wounds. And yet, despite this, or, or maybe because from birth they're exposed to these animals, none of these folks, of these bed these monkey performers, are infected with a simian foamy virus that we find other, or other villagers in Bangladesh infected with. In fact, the Bede are not infected with any of the common simian viruses that we've, that we've detected in, in human populations. That's fairly extraordinary. And that is actually kind of what's leading us to some of the next steps in this, this work, which is, what is it about the Bede? Is it this acquired immunity from, again, remember these are very, kind of a very homogeneous ethnic group. Is it something, is it something innate? Um, we've been doing some work suggesting that Aphobec 3 is, is certainly at play with these foamy viruses. Does it have something to do with herbal treatments? We really, we don't know. And that's where this, this research is going to the, to the next step as we continue to understand this. And, it's, and we've only been looking at the Bede in Bangladesh. The, uh, the Fulbright was actually, gave me a chance to get a little peek 
at some of the other countries where this tradition exists. So whether it's in Sri Lanka or in Myanmar, which I think the tradition is even more diverse than we see in Bangladesh because there were so many different species of macaques that are actually involved in that performing monkey tradition. So that's the, the next place that we're moving on to with that. So with that, the, um, the photographs, again, so I mentioned that Lynn Johnson, who at National Geographic, was very interested in performing monkeys, so I had her there with us. Her work is, is shown up here, and this work happens because there are many different people from many different skill sets, and that's, you need that. If you were dealing with humans, you're dealing with animals, it takes a diverse group of people to understand that. So, there you go, thank you.